Hi, this is Eric White. This is the second in a series of screencasts on adding and updating tables of contents in OpenXML Word Processing ML documents. In this screencast, I'm going to examine some code that I've written for the Power Tools for OpenXML project that enables you to more easily insert a table of contents into a document. It inserts this table of contents into the document without all of the content between the separate and end of the field. The best way to update the actual contents of the table of content is to either use Word programmatically to do so or to use Word Automation Services to update it. Those are the tools that can do the correct pagination First of all, looking at a little document, very similar to the last one that we created. First, let's take a look at a small example that shows how to insert a table of content using this class in OpenXML Power Tools. Its use couldn't be simpler. The code first opens up the word processing document. It then determines the X element for the first paragraph in the document. It then calls toc adder dot add toc, passing the open document, passing the element for the first paragraph, passing the text of the instructional text, and then passing null for a couple of arguments so that the default values are used for that. Let's take a look at the prototype for add toc. Here's add toc. The first argument is the word processing document that is open. The second argument is that element which I passed the first paragraph in. This argument is called add before and the table of contents is going to be inserted as a sibling to that element immediately before that element. So this means that you can pick where in the document you want the table of content to be inserted. The third argument is the switches that are documented in the OpenXML standard. We're going to take a look at that. The fourth argument is the title and if you pass null then the title is set to simply contents. The fifth argument is the right tab position and if you pass null then the right tab position is set to 9350. There are circumstances when you'd want to change the right tab position. So having the ability to specify the right tab position to the add TOC method gives you control over where the page numbers are on the page. Now that we've looked at the programming interface, let's run the example. This example places the documents with the inserted table of content in the bin debug directory. Let's look at the markup before we look at the document. Here we can see the content control that has the doc park gallery with a value of table of contents. Here is the paragraph that contains the heading that is styled TOC heading and it has the contents, the textual contents of contents, and this paragraph contains the field for the table of contents. Here's the filled car with a filled car type of begin. Here is the instructional text. This was the string that was passed to the function, and here is the separate, and here is the end. We can also look at the settings part. And you can see that the code also added the update fields element to the settings part. I'll close that and not save it. And now I'll open that document and of course Word puts up the message. I'll respond yes. And you can see that the table of contents are updated. This particular table of content as you saw in the markup is in a content control. Let's go back to this first document where I inserted the table of content using Word. Let's take a look at some of the markup in that document. 
So far, we've looked at the document part. We've looked at the settings part. The next thing is we'll look at the font table part. If I open the font table part and go to the bottom of the font table, this font Tahoma, when Word inserts the table of content, it formats the table of contents with the font of Tahoma. So if this font wasn't inserted previously, it needs to be inserted when we insert the markup for the table of content. Next, I'm going to look at the styles part. I'm going to the bottom of the styles part. And starting here, we can see several styles that were inserted into the styles part when Word inserted the table of contents into the document. First, it inserted a TOC heading style. It also inserted a TOC1 and a TOC2 style. It inserted a hyperlink style. It inserted this balloon text and this balloon text care style. Those are two linked styles. One's a paragraph style, the other's a character style, and you can see that they are linked to each other. Linked styles and styles in general, that's a topic for another day. I'll get to it before too awfully long, I hope. And if we open styles with effects and go to the bottom of it, we see the exact same set of styles. TOC heading, TOC 1 and 2, hyperlink, balloon text, and balloon text car. Interestingly, these styles have the exact same definition in both parts. Here's the TOC adder class. At the top of the TOC adder class, there is a utility method. It's a private static utility method that adds an element if missing. It takes an X document for the part. It takes the X element of the existing element if it exists and it takes a chunk of XML as a string. And this utility method adds the new X element to the root element of the X document. Here is the code to update the font table part. It gets the font table part and it adds an element if missing. First, doing a query looking for the Tahoma font and then passing this chunk of XML that defines the Tahoma font Here's the code to update the styles part. As with updating the font table part, this method calls add element if missing. And if we scroll down through this method, we can see very similar code being used to insert all of the other elements that we need to insert in order to add a table of content and have it look the way we want it to look. Here's the code to update styles with effects. If you want to write code that creates a table of content with an interesting look, you'd want to customize these methods and make them generate the styles that you want to use as appropriate. Now let's go back to add TOC and look at the rest of that method. Here you can see the first thing it does is call the method update font table part. It calls update styles part for TOC update styles with effects part for TOC. It then takes this string of XML and creates the XML that will be inserted into the document at the point where you specify. You'll notice a couple of things about this string. It's actually a string that is expected to be passed to string.format. When passing this to string.format, the first parameter will be the heading of the table of content. The second parameter is the right tab position. And the third parameter is the switches that we pass to this method. Down here, the code is very straightforward. It calls string.format, passing the appropriate arguments. It parses that string using xElement.parse. It gets the X document for the main document part, calls add before self on the add before element, and writes that X document back into the package. And here's the little chunk of code that goes into the settings part and adds the update fields element to the settings part. There are two public methods in this TOC adder class. The next one is add TOF or a table of figures, very similar to adding a TOC. 
you pass a document, you pass the add before element, you pass in the switches and the right tab position. The only difference is in this method, it calls a different method to update the styles part for the table of fields and update styles with effects part for TOF. Let's look at some more examples. The next example inserts the table of contents immediately after the title of the document. The way this code works is that when selecting the X element that contains the paragraph that the table of contents will be inserted before, the code, first of all, gets a collection of all the descendant paragraphs. It skips the first paragraph and then it takes the first or default paragraph, which is the second paragraph in the document. When it passes that second paragraph to add TOC, the table of contents is inserted immediately before it. In this particular case, this works because we know that the title of the document is contained in the first paragraph. A more sophisticated approach might be something like searching for a paragraph based on its style or based on its content or some other marker, then having toc adder dot add toc add the paragraph before the paragraph that you found by some means or another. Let's look at test o two dot docx and there's the title and the heading, and let's look at the generated test o two dot docx. I'll respond yes. And here you can see that the table of contents was added after the title of the document. The next example is almost identical to the first example, except that it passes table of contents in as the fourth argument. So this enables you to control what the title of the table of contents is. If we look at the switches in the last three examples, you can see this slash O quote one dash three quote. These switches specify to Word to take the heading levels of one to three and use those in the table of contents. If you have a paragraph with a heading level of four, it won't be included in the table of contents. So down here, the difference in this example is that I've modified the switches to specify that Word should use headings of levels one through four for the table of content. Let's look at test 04. You can see that there are headings with the style of heading four. Close it. Let's look at the updated version and here's that table of content. It has items in the table of contents through heading four. Let's go take a look at the OpenXML standard IS29500. I'll open up the navigation pane here. Expand Word Processing ML reference material. Expand fields and hyperlinks. Expand field definitions. And down here we can find TOC. If we go into TOC, we can find the slash O field argument, which specifies that it uses paragraphs formatted with all or the specified range of built-in heading styles. Headings in a style range are specified by text in the switches field argument using the notation specified as for backslash L, where each integer corresponds to the style with the style ID of heading X, e.g. one corresponds to heading one. This is just a long way of saying that you have to specify 1-3 or 1-4 if you want to include heading levels 1 through 3 or 1 through 4. There are a lot of different arguments that are interesting for this TOC field. If you need to generate specialized tables of contents, I recommend that you take a look at this section. It's section 17.16.5.68. It has a lot of good information in here about specifying the format of the table of content. Because you can specify the switches as an argument to add TOC, it gives you a great amount of control over exactly how your table of contents looks. The last example inserts a table of figures. Here you can see that the switches are somewhat different than inserting a table of content. Let's open up the source 
document for this. Here's a figure on the second page. It's got the caption of the clipboard tab. Here's a figure on the third page. It's got the caption of figure two, the font tab. Close that. Let's go look at the generated one. Here you can see that the table of figures has been updated properly. In this screencast, we've examined the markup for table of contents in detail. We've seen how you can insert a field that specifies that a table of contents be inserted at a certain place in a document. We've seen how you don't actually have to specify any of the actual contents of the table of contents. Instead, you insert a field with nothing between the separate and the end and you set the update field element to true in the settings part and then Word will update the table of contents the next time that a user opens the document. You've also seen how Word puts up a dialog box indicating that this document will be updated and may refer to other files. In the next screencast I'm going to show you how you can avoid having the user see that modal dialog box when they open a document that has an unupdated table of content. There are two approaches. We can use Word Automation, which I'm going to show you in the next screencast, and we can use Word Automation Services, which I'm going to show you in the final screencast. Word Automation and Word Automation Services have very similar names but are very different technologies. If you're interested, you can read a blog post that I wrote some time ago that makes clear the distinction between Word Automation and Word Automation Services. You can find that blog post here. This concludes the second in this series of screencasts on tables of contents. See you in the next screencast.